you may be seated today. We have a special guest, Derry, a, Derek A. Stryker, that's with the Montana, he's the attorney for the Montana Family Foundation, and so he's coming up. But he is going to share about the culture war that we're in. And I just want to give you, uh, I just want to give you one example. Uh, uh, have you heard the story in the last week about the Romikes, uh, a family from Germany? Uh, they were seeking asylum to come to the United States because they said that the teaching that their children were getting in the schools of Germany were in direct, direct opposition to the biblical worldview they were teaching them. So they were threatened that they would have their children taken away or that the father would go to prison for homeschooling their children. So they sought asylum to come to the United States of America. Now, last week in one day, over 11,000 people crossed our border. Uh, you know we have a fentanyl crisis, an epidemic with that. We've now become the number one nation in the world for sex trafficking because of that, because we're just letting the border stay open. Our State Department is sending them back to Germany. So is that not insane that they would send them to Germany, but let our border, that's the cultural war that we're in. So give Derek a hand clap, and let's get it over with, Derek, one more time. Let's just get it over with. I'll pull the band off. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I was actually invited by Tom Rasmussen here, um, who sits on our board for the Montana Family Foundation. So thank you for inviting me, Tom. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad to be here with you. It's when I, when I come and speak at a church, I like to get things out of the way up front. And so, you know, the most common question that I get, I'll just give you the answer. I'm six foot 11, okay? <laughs> so we'll get that out of the way. And, uh, uh, but I'm very excited to be here today with you. I'm, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a pastor. Um, I didn't go to seminary. So uh, I, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, I'm a lobbyist, I'm a believer. Um, and, and I'm here to talk to you basically about what we do every day at the Montana Family Foundation, we engage in the culture war. So I've divided my message into two parts. The first part is an update, an update about the legislative session and some litigation that precipitated from there. Um, our, our mission, our values at the Montana Family Foundation, what we do, who we are, and what our goals are for the future, for the future of our organization and for the future of the state the second part of my message um, is probably a little more controversial than politics, at least in some churches, and that's whether or not Christians should engage in the culture war. That's, that's the starting point in a lot of churches. I think it's a little bit different in this church. I think the answer is yes, but then the question becomes well, how? How do we engage in the culture war? So I'm going to get a little political this morning. I don't mean to offend anyone. Political issues can be divisive. Uh, that can be jarring, and so if I say something that, that offends you, I'm sorry. Um, I don't mean to offend you. I, I mean to speak the truth in love and with compassion and, and with conviction. Uh, so with that, I know uh, your pastor mentioned this story. I'm actually not going to talk about this kind of battle. Um, believe it or not, it's not my favorite story in the Bible um, for obvious reasons. And I saw Pastor Paul with a slingshot earlier, and going to watch out. <laughs> so a little background on the Montana Family Foundation. We're a nonprofit research and education organization um, devoted to strengthening and protecting Montana families. That's our mission. We do that in four main action areas, life, religious liberty, marriage and family, and school choice. That's all about family for us. We have strategic partners both in, in state and nationally. Montana churches, your church, is a strategic partner for us. Thank you for partnering with the Montana Family Foundation. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us in the halls of the Capitol. I, I look around in this church and I see people that I've seen up at the Capitol. And that's, that's not common uh, when I travel around the state and, and meet with other, other church bodies. Um, thank you guys for being warriors for the kingdom of God here in, in Helena. I appreciate that. Other partners include Nationally Alliance Defending Freedom. Some of you may have heard of them. It's the largest Christian law firm in the nation. Um, they're routinely advocating in front of the U.S. Supreme Court 
and circuit courts, they also help us and me, and I can geek out with their attorneys on, on policy issues, so that's kind of fun. We have other national partners like Family Research Council, Family Policy Alliance, Focus on the Family, um, and others. Montana Family Foundation, I'll talk a little bit about Jeff Lasloff, he is our president. Um, prior to, to joining our organization, he was the speaker pro temp at Montana House of Representatives. That was over 20 years ago now. He's been the president of our organization for more than 20 years, faithfully serving in this role. Oftentimes, on, on pieces of legislation, Jeff will be the only person standing up in support or in opposition on certain policy issues. Um, but I feel like that's changing, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, moving forward. I joined the organization in December of last year. Uh, prior to that, I was the Chief Deputy Attorney General and General Counsel at the Department of Justice here in Montana in Austin Knudsen's administration. Um, and I just felt the Lord tugging on my heart to get out of state government, I, uh, and it was God's timing. And I'm, I'm so thankful to be where I am now, working for the Family Foundation. Truly, is the, the best job I could, I could ever have. So I get, to, I get to fight in the culture war every day. Uh, so let's talk about it. Um, now, the first area that I want to talk about is the area of life. Um, now, I, I, I realize the area of life can be a really sensitive topic. Um, and I want, to, I want to let you know just where I'm coming from. I believe that each one of us in here was knit together in our mother's womb, designed by God for a special plan and a special purpose. That's where I approach it from. And I believe life starts at conception. And I believe science supports this. Uh, you can actually do some, some research on your own. Uh, has, has anyone heard of the spark of life? You guys have heard of the spark of life? There's actually a zinc reaction at the moment of conception that lights up the egg when it's fertilized. You can look this up. They've studied it with a really powerful microscope. At the moment of conception, you can see when life starts, and it's incredible. I believe, I believe life starts at conception. Um, so that's where I'm approaching it from. If you're not there with me, that's okay. I'm, I'm not trying to, to convince you or persuade you. I'm just letting you know that's where I'm coming from. So that, that's what informs my discussion of this issue. Okay, take a look at this slide. There were so many bills on the issue of life, so many wonderful bills. I, I could barely fit all of them on the slide. And it's tiny print, and I apologize for that. But what this means is, this past session was the most, by all accounts, the most pro-life legislative session in Montana history. Our legislators and our governor passed more robust and substantive policy to protect unborn babies than anywhere else in the country, really. Incredible. So be proud of that. Those policy victories are wonderful in this area of life. And I want to talk, highlight a couple of them. There's, there's many, and we can talk about individual bills afterwards. I'm easy to find if you want to talk more. Um, I want to talk about one in particular was defining viability, the term viability. Um, back in 1973 with the Roe versus Wade case at our US Supreme Court, that was really the, the marker, the point in time at which abortion is either appropriate or inappropriate, according to the courts. But that marker is, is really an inappropriate point at which to, to decide this issue. Because viability, back in 1973, was somewhere around 28 or 30 weeks, depending on where you lived and what medical professionals you had access to. It's changed. We have babies born at 22 weeks and even earlier sometimes. Viability is a poor marker. So when we put the onus on healthcare professionals to make that determination of when is when is this baby viable? That's something they're really uncomfortable with. And we, can, we can go into that a little bit further. Huge policy win uh, here in Montana. Put the onus on the healthcare professionals to say when that child is viable. And, and that's, that's a lot of pressure. Another bill that we passed, and, and as we go through this and we talk about the culture war, I'm going to be focused on language. As a lawyer, I'm, I'm really focused on definitions and language and, and the language that we use. And the other side wants to control our language. Have you noticed this? They want you to, con they want you to use their preferred pronouns. They want you to affirm their identity. They want to control the way you speak and the way you talk about things. 
And to highlight this, one of, one of our bills in the area of life was House Bill 721, where we in Montana prohibited dismemberment abortions. Dismemberment abortion, it's horrific, it's awful, but it is the most common abortion procedure in the country. And the other side of this issue likes to call it a D&E procedure, dilation and evacuation. That's what they call it, very innocuous terminology. They want to hide the truth of what is really happening in this procedure. Well, in this bill, we call the spade a spade. And we said, we're going to prohibit dismemberment abortions. Passed and signed by the governor. Huge policy victories in the area of life. Now, I'll get into this in a little bit, but, but a lot of these policy victories have been put on ice. If you've been following the news, we haven't lost. They're delayed. We haven't lost. I, wanna, I want you to keep in mind. But in our courts, a lot of these policy wins at the legislature and with our governor, they have been enjoined. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. So in the area of life, amazing victories, something to be very proud of, very proud of your representatives for passing these. Next issue is religious liberty. Um, if we learned anything from the, the pandemic, it was that we're really grateful here in Montana for our, the, the bill passed by Jennifer Carlson in 2021 to protect everyone from being forced to take the vaccination uh, uh, for COVID if they didn't want to. Uh, here in Montana, we were, we were the only state that had that kind of protection. Um, and I was very thankful for it myself. Um, I saw uh, someone in the church last night that had a t-shirt on that said he was fully vaccinated by the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, that was a great shirt. Um, so I felt pretty comfortable talking here with you guys. Um, but around the country, we, we heard stories about people that were losing their jobs if they weren't going to get the vaccination. Now, that was one side of the issue. The other side of the issue was healthcare professionals that were forced to conduct procedures or administer vaccinations that they found objectionable based on their deeply held religious convictions. So House Bill 303 in the area of religious liberty, this was a bill brought by Amy Regeer, a legislator from the Flathead area. She happens to be a nurse, and she championed this bill to protect medical rights of conscience for our healthcare professionals. So if you're a healthcare professional and you find it objectionable based on your faith to administer a vaccination, or to participate in a procedure uh, to, to provide gender-affirming care to a child or to anyone, you're protected. You can't be forced to do that by your employer, by a big healthcare system or a hospital system. So great protection for our healthcare workers in the state. Religious liberty is flourishing here in Montana. Some other bills to highlight. Um, and I'll just give you a little background. One of, the, one of the most common calls that we get at the Montana Family Foundation is from parents of children, um, and they're dealing with an issue at school. We had, as an example, a, a little girl um, went, went to school one day for bring your favorite book to school day. She brought her Bible. Aww. Pretty awesome, right? What a cute little girl. Her teacher told her, you can bring any book, but you can't bring that one. Send her home. The parents got in touch with us. Um, and look, a lot of this comes from a, a misunderstanding or no understanding of where the law is, where the line is in terms of religion and, and the Bible in schools. So we got involved, we wrote a demand letter, we talked with the school administration, and they reversed course when they understood what the law actually is. They can't discriminate against Christians. That's what the, the law says, that's what it always has been. So just to make the line even more clear, we had two bills this past session, House Bill 744 and House Bill 745, that clarified that. It said, your children, when they go to school, they can bring their Bible. They can pray in school. They can talk about their religious beliefs. Both of those bills passed by the legislature just to enshrine that, not just for our parents and our children to know where the law is, but also our teachers. They might need a little help there too, and that's okay, and we want to approach that issue with grace. Next, next issue area, school choice. Now, if, if any of you have followed the school choice agenda and, and what it stands for, you know that it, it's all about providing children with the best educational environment where they're gonna be successful. That's all it's about. Uh, Jeff Lasloffy, our president, has five kids, and most of them are around my age now. Um, 
but when they were growing up, they, they called themselves an equal education opportunity family. And so they, of those five kids, they had kids that were homeschooled, went to a, a charter school, public school, and private school. They, they tried it all out, and they put their kids in the best situation where they were gonna be successful for their education. That was their philosophy, and our philosophy at the Montana Family Foundation is that every parent should be equipped with that, that kind of option for their kids. Put your kids in, in the best educational environment for that child. And parents know their kids a heck of a lot better than the schools do. Parents, parents should be in the driver's seat when they're making that decision. So we, for the first time in Montana history, we had charter school bills passed, House Bill 562 brought by Sue Vinton. It established a commission to authorize community choice schools in Montana. Fantastic win for school choice for parents in Montana. Another thing that came out of the pandemic, just to shift gears too, is we saw and we heard horror stories from, from schools that were really driving a wedge between children and their parents. This past session, we heard a story from a couple in Missoula who had a daughter in high school. And this girl um, started to have some identity issues, some, some crises about her identity. She came from a Christian home, but she sought out the help of the school counselor. From the get-go, the school counselor told her, don't talk to your parents about this, about our sessions. Don't go to your parents. They're believers. They're not going to understand what, what you're going through. So immediately, wedge is being pushed between child and family. Over the course of a year and a half, up until this girl's 18th birthday, um, she was seeing this counselor. And on her 18th birthday, she moved out of her parents' home, still in high school, hasn't spoken with her parents, didn't, didn't speak with her younger sister who attended the same school ever since. And the parents were confused. They had no idea what was going on. The school never told them. But they found, after a couple months, they found this girl's diary. And that's where they found out that this girl had been seeing a school counselor. This girl had been going by a different name at school, a non-binary name, and that she was planning on moving in with a member of the same sex on her 18th birthday. They found all this out in, in the diary. The school was keeping them in the dark. The school shouldn't be doing that. Schools shouldn't be driving a wedge between children and their parents. Yeah. And that's not the role of the school. And so we also passed House Bill 7, uh, 676, and this enshrined parental bill of rights here in Montana. So parents have, have a right to access all records related to their children. So that's your school records, your medical records. You have a right to know as a parent. You have a right to be informed. You should be in the driver's seat when you're making decisions for your child. So that's another great policy win here in Montana. All right, so I saved kind of the most controversial for last, marriage and family. If you want to see a, a spiritual battle going on in front of you during the legislative session, show up to one of the Judiciary Committees in the morning, either the Senate or the House Judiciary Committee. That's where these types of bills are debated. That's where people testify on these types of bills. It is a palpable spiritual battle. We, just to give you an example, we had a bill um, related to prohibiting drag queen story hours in Montana. If you want to see a spiritual battle, you can go watch the archives of, of that hearing. There are some characters there, uh, literal characters dressed up, and, and for some strange reason, begging to be able to put on a drag show in front of children. Oh my and now, I, I have kids, and for those of you who have kids, I, my kids have never asked me for permission to go see somebody dressed in drag. It's just not something that children are begging for. But why is the inverse true? Why are these drag performers begging to perform in front of children? No one could answer that question, but we know the reason. They're grooming our children because this culture war preys on the vulnerable. It preys on the innocent. It preys on the people that aren't yet equipped to defend themselves from these attacks. And, and you know, the, when I was preparing for this message, we had no idea that an, a literal war would have broken out yesterday in Israel. But the analogy is there. Hamas is kidnapping children, families, civilians. They're going after the vulnerable. 
the, the, the culture war is the same way. And that's why you see such an onslaught against our children. I want to highlight two bills in this area. Got a little sidetracked with the drag queen story hour thing. Senate Bill 99. Senate Bill 99 was one of the most important bills from past session. This bill was about protecting kids. Anyone under the age of 18 from what I call experimental medical interventions. It's not healthcare, it's intervention. You are intervening in a child's development when you prescribe them puberty blockers, when you prescribe them cross-sex hormones, when you conduct a radical and irreversible gender reassignment surgery. All of these things are irreversible. If you prescribe somebody puberty blockers, they're going to be dealing with irreversible repercussions from that for the rest of their life. Same thing with cross-sex hormones. All of these things are irreversible. Don't believe the lie of the, of the other side on this issue that it can be reversed. It can't. It can't. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of, of why this is important. Has anyone heard the story of Chloe Cole? A few of us? Okay. Chloe Cole is, is now an 18-year-old woman. Um, at age 12, Chloe was dealing with kind of an identity crisis in her life. And she sought the help of a gender therapist. She lived in California. She, she went at 12 years old to a gender therapist. The gender therapist prescribed her at 12 puberty blockers. Then at 13, cross-sex hormones. At 14, she had a double mastectomy. At 15, she went through menopause. At 15. And at 16, she realized she had been lied to and she had made the biggest mistake of her life. And so now Chloe Cole travels the world talking about the dangers of this transgender ideology because it's dangerous and it's irreversible and it's preying on our children, especially young women. Especially young women. So that's why this bill is important. And we heard from the other side that it's not happening in Montana. It isn't here. There's no providers that are, that are doing this here. There's no children. This is a California issue. This is a New York issue. Don't believe it, because a couple weeks after the session ended, two 16-year-old boys who claim to be girls, two 16-year-old boys, their parents, and two health care providers in the state of Montana filed an action to challenge Senate Bill 99. And just 11 days ago, a judge in Missoula enjoined Senate Bill 99 from protecting children in Montana. A judge in Missoula appointed by uh, our previous governor, Steve Bullock, enjoined this law. Two days after that decision, and listen, folks, he got, he got it wrong. It was a swing in the myth by this judge. He got it wrong. He didn't apply. We can get into, we can get into this. You want to hear about levels of scrutiny and, and constitutional issues, come talk to me afterwards. He got it wrong. And you want to know why I know that? It's because the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, two days after that decision in Missoula, issued their own opinion about Kentucky and Tennessee's laws, virtually identical to Montana's. And they got it right. They got it right on this issue, saying that the state, like Montana, like Tennessee, like Kentucky, they have a compelling interest in protecting children. We do it with cigarettes. We do it with alcohol. We do it with driving vehicles. We can do it in this area as well. We can protect kids. So we haven't lost that. It's just put on ice. I want to I wanna make sure you understand that. I haven't even talked about, and this is, I haven't even talked about the most controversial bill of the session, and that was Senate Bill 458. And this bill did something very simple. It defined three terms. It defined the term male, female, and biological sex. That's all it did. But that bill turned out to be the biggest battleground for the entire session, just defining those terms. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Because the arguments embracing this transgender ideology depend on conflating the terms gender and sex. And look it up. Google this. Are sex and gender the same thing? They're not. Maybe 100 years ago, they meant the same thing. They were kind of synonymous. Not anymore. They don't mean the same thing. Gender can't be defined. It's some sort of spectrum or continuum. 
you can find yourself at one point one day and then another point the next day. You see it all the time, and the transgender ideology gets pushed to further and further limits. Have you guys heard of transabled? People have heard of this? Okay, transabled means, uh, well, I'll give you an example. There was a, a video of a woman I saw recently. This woman uh, could see, but wanted to identify as somebody who was blind. So with the help of her therapist, she blinded herself. This is a real thing. And this is, this is how far it goes. Transabled, transgendered. It depends on confusion. It depends on conflating these terms, sex and gender. So we didn't, we didn't define gender. There's no point. We're not gonna try and define gender. We actually invited opponents of this bill. Go ahead and provide us with the definition of gender. They couldn't, they can't. But we can define sex. Sex is created by God. It's immutable. You cannot change it. And it's binary. There are only two, male and female. There are only two. So you might be thinking, okay, well, you know, big whoop, we can answer Matt Walsh's question, what is a woman? <laughs> what does this really mean? Well, this bill is about protecting women. I'll give you a story. My wife went to law school in Missoula for one week. Okay? She went for one week because if you've seen any law school movies or read about law school, there's very typical, you sit down your first day, they say, look to your left, look to your right. One of you is not going to be here at the end. You know, law school, lots of people drop out, you know, as they go through the process. It's just a reality. Not in Missoula. In Missoula, they say, look to your left, look to your right. Guess what? We have 27 different genders represented in this class of 85. What? My wife went to the, the restroom during her time there and a biological male followed her in. She called me and said, I'm coming home. She's, she's gone to a different law school, she's doing great, my wife's awesome. But I, I tell you that story because Senate Bill 458, defining these terms, protects women. It protects women in the bathroom. It protects women who are incarcerated. Have you heard the stories of, of male predators who in prison decide I'm going to identify as a woman, they get put in with the female population, and they're still male predators. It protects women when they play sports. Now, I would do really well in the WNBA. <laughs> but it wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair. I have a daughter. I want her to, to play sports. I want the competition to be fair. I don't want her playing against guys like me. I don't, want, I don't want that for my daughter. This bill is about protecting women. It's about protecting women, and it's about eliminating the confusion between sex and gender. And so these, these are some of the things that we fight in the culture war, in the legislature. But the battle doesn't end when the legislature goes sine die. Right afterwards, we enter into a period of what I like to call lawsuit season. As a, as a lawyer, it's kind of fun for me, but not for everybody. Um, I, I have listed up here five different cases that have been filed just from bills from this past session. I mean, think about it. We're only six months out from this past session. We've already got five cases. Seven of our bills have been challenged. There's actually more cases. But these are, these are our bills. Each one of these lawsuits represents a case in which a judge in Montana has already issued what's called an injunction. And that's just a pause on the proceedings. They haven't heard all the evidence. They haven't heard testimony from all the witnesses. But they have decided already, put the law on hold. You can't enforce the law until we have a trial on the merits, which in theory is fine. The problem is that pause can last for years. We have a case right now that we're still litigating that was an injunction from a law passed in 2011. It's been enjoined for 12 years and counting. It still hasn't gone to trial. It's been through eight district court judges. What progressive organizations do in this state is they use our judiciary as a form of super veto 
for policies that protect family, protect children, protect life. That's what our judiciary and this mechanism of preliminary injunctions has become. Now, we have some reform in that area, and we're working on that. The fight isn't over. And again, we haven't lost these cases. They've just been enjoined. So keep that in mind when you, when you see these things in the paper. You know, judge strikes down law. He hasn't. He's just enjoined it. We haven't lost. So that's kind of the update on, on litigation and, and legislation just from this past session. Um, if you have any interest in, in talking about anything in particular, come find me. I'm happy to discuss further. But here, here's the, the second part of my message to you today, and, and that's, should we engage in the culture war? And if so, how? How are Christians supposed to be engaging in this battle? So before we get started on answering those questions, I think we need to define terms, okay? I, I think that's always a good starting point. What is a culture war? If we don't know what it is that we're engaged in, we've already lost. So let's define it. Culture war is a conflict between social groups over their values, beliefs, and practices. Anyone threatened by that definition? It's not really threatening. It's pretty innocuous. It's, you know, there's, there's nothing really at stake in that definition. So what? We have conflict over our values and beliefs. Until you realize what the objective of the culture war is. The objective is the destruction and replacement of one ethos and its culture for another. That's what's at stake. Hamas, Hezbollah, they're not just trying to ask it, you know, Jews to, to move out of that area. They want to wipe them off the map. They want to destroy and replace Israel. The same thing is true in the culture war with respect to our Christian faith. These competing cultures want to destroy your worldview, your faith in Jesus Christ, and replace it with something else. That's what the culture war is about. So let's talk about some of the players. I've only got three up here. There are many others. There are many worldviews, okay? And, and we can talk about some other ones. There are subsets within these three. And I chose uh, kind of bumper stickers to represent them. Um, anyone have the coexist bumper sticker on their car in the parking lot? No? OK. The culture war means those cultures can't coexist. That's what the culture war is about. Though they, there is no coexistence. There is one way. Jesus. Amen. There is one way. But let's talk about this. Cultural Marxism. And I got some of this from, from the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. It's a, a think tank out there. Um, and they studied this uh, ideology of cultural Marxism. And pay attention to, to how this is defined and the goal of cultural Marxism. This ideology seeks to infiltrate institutions and all of society and raise the consciousness of the oppressed with a new cultural worldview. Sounds really familiar to the objective of the culture war. They want to raise the consciousness of the oppressed. And who are the oppressed? Have you guys seen this in today's society, this kind of celebration of victimhood? We have all different sorts of victims. We have all different sorts of people who are oppressed. I'm oppressed on an airplane. <laughs> I'm oppressed when I walk through a door. You can create different categories of oppression. And then the goal is, Create these different categories and then replace their former worldview with something else. And this isn't about raising up arms. They do this as a slow infiltration of every institution of society. Are we seeing this? Are we seeing this in our schools? Are we seeing this on university campuses? Are you seeing this when you turn on the TV? Are you seeing this infiltration? That's what cultural Marxism is about. Moral relativism. You guys have probably heard people that kind of embrace this idea. The people that say, I'm just living my truth. Have you heard this? Truth is not subjective. It's objective. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is one truth. It's objective. But cultural Marxism would have you believe that you're your own God, 
You decide what's true. Everything's permitted. Nothing is sacred. And that leads to some very dangerous, very dangerous ideas, like being transabled, like blinding yourself. I also threw on here atheism, agnosticism. If you, if you disbelieve the existence of God or you're ambivalent towards it, it can lead to some dangerous worldviews that seek to destroy and replace our Christian faith. Okay. So we've identified what the culture war is, what the objective is. We've identified some of the players. Okay. Let's think about whether or not this culture war has had any effect on our churches, on our faith. So I did some, some research. Uh, Pew Research conducts studies all the time. Um, one of the things they did, they studied what Christians believe. So I'll give you some statistics and you decide. According to Pew Research, 58% of all Christians say, quote, many religions can lead to eternal life in heaven. 58%. That's more than half of all believers aren't reading the Bible. 33% of all U.S. adults believe in reincarnation. 30% of all evangelicals believe that, quote, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 42% of all evangelicals believe, quote, God accepts the worship of all religions including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Has our faith been watered down? Or is the culture war slowly infiltrating the church? Is it affecting the way churches view our creator? Is it affecting the way we understand the Bible? This is the reason I believe Christians are called to engage in this battle for truth. We're not supposed to raise up arms and go shooting up Planned Parenthood buildings. That's not what the Bible says to do. Our weapons in this battle are much different. But, but our main weapon is the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's what it is. So with that, I want to build a profile. You know, much like the armor of God that we're supposed to put on. Once we have that armor on, how are we supposed to engage in this battle? Okay, so I want to build a profile by examining what the Bible has to say about engaging in the culture war. Christ says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It has been good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So salt has a couple different attributes. Salt has flavor, so we're supposed to provide flavor to the world. We're the salt of the earth. What's another attribute of salt? It preserves. That's right. So in this culture war, if the other side is trying to destroy and replace our worldview, we must engage. It's right there to season and preserve the earth in this battle. I also want to examine a story in Acts chapter 4. Um, I think you've been preaching in Acts, or maybe some of these verses. Uh, to understand what's going on in Acts chapter 4, you actually have to look at Acts chapter 3, but I'll, I'll summarize that, and then we'll pick up the story in, in chapter 4. So this is the story of Peter and John, and they're in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 3, and they're going up to the temple in Jerusalem. And on their way up to the temple, they meet a beggar, a man sitting there on, on your way up to the temple, and in Acts chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says that this man had been lame from his mother's womb. And I love that it says that. It acknowledges life in the womb right there. So this man's begging for change, as he has for years. And he looks up at, at Peter and John. And what do they tell him? Silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he does. He gets up. It's a miracle. He's walking. He's jumping around. You could end the story there. That's, that's amazing. But that really isn't what we're here to talk about. Because I want to talk about Acts chapter 4, what happens after this miracle. 
Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. So who are these characters? These are the people in power, people in authority. Okay? Think in modern terms. These are your politicians. These are, these are your elected officials. These are the people of influence and power and control. They came upon them being greatly disturbed. Think about why are they greatly disturbed? Greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them. They grabbed them. And they put them in custody. They threw Peter and John in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So this is a great miracle. A lot of witnesses. A lot of people saw this. But the people in power come, grab Peter and John, throw them in jail until the next day. Why? Why? Why were they greatly disturbed? Because the gospel message was a threat to their culture. It was a threat to their authority. It was a threat to their power and control over the people. And it always has been in this culture war. It always has been. The tactics don't change in this culture war in the past 2,000 years. And I hope, I hope you'll see that. So they throw Peter and John in jail, and their goal is to shut down this gospel message. Let's pick up the story again in verse 15. And I'll kind of set the stage. This is the part of the story that I really like as a lawyer because it's, kind of it's kind of a hearing that's going on. Okay? It's a hearing. It's the next day. They haul Peter and John out of jail, and they set them down. And Peter and John, they're unrepresented. It, um, they don't have an attorney or a lawyer. They're just going to have to argue their own case pro se. And they're fishermen. They're uneducated. And they're doing a really good job. They're impressing the tribunal. You know, they're, they're holding their own. And the guy that is the evidence of the miracle is in the back of the courtroom. He's standing there. He's standing there. So the leaders, these judges, these position, uh, people in positions of power and influence, they decide to have a sidebar. So we'll pick it up in verse 15. And they commanded them to go aside out of the council. And they conferred among themselves, this is the sidebar, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. Everybody knows about this, and we cannot deny it. It's right there. The evidence is right there. But what's the tactic in the culture war? But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. The tactics are the same today. They want to control your language. They want to shut down the gospel message, and they want you to use their preferred pronouns. They want to severely threaten you that if you don't affirm whatever identity your child chooses, they're going to take your kids away. The tactics are the same in this culture war the same as they were 2,000 years ago. So they called them in, and they commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But don't miss this. Don't miss how Peter and John responded, because it's how we should respond. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We can't help call a man a man, or a woman a woman, or speak truth to a child who is confused about their gender identity. Speak truth to them that God created them for a special purpose and a special plan. We can't help but speak the truth as Christians. I love that response. Threaten us, throw us in jail, do whatever you want, but we're going to be warriors for the kingdom of God. That's what we're called to do. But it's not just speaking the truth. There's more to it. Paul tells us in Ephesians, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, 
Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. It's not just about speaking truth to that child, speaking truth to that mother who doesn't know how, how she's going to bring this baby into the world, speaking truth to that father who doesn't know how he's going to support a family. It's not just speaking truth. We also need to expose the unfruitful works of darkness of the healthcare lobbyists who are promoting these policies, of the medical professionals that are lying to kids and creating lifelong patients, subservient. We need to expose them. We're called to do that. Speak truth and expose this evil. What else? We need to always be prepared. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. You see, the culture war doesn't just happen in the halls of the Capitol. It's not just you know, a four-month battle every other year. It's all around you. And you always have to be prepared. Always have to be prepared. So here's that profile I was talking about. We need to be engaged in the culture war. You guys know that. But here's how we engage. When we have that armor of God on, we need to engage in prayer. We need to speak truth. We need to speak with boldness and with love and compassion. Always be prepared. We need to stay committed to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And this last one's really important. Do not retreat. You are not on defense in this culture war. You aren't on defense. We're on offense. And we are winning, and we are going to win. If you've read the end of the book, we're, we're going to win. Yes. And you are on offense. Don't retreat. Don't take a defensive posture in this culture war. Don't be ashamed of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And this is the God we serve. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. That's guaranteed, folks. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That is the God we serve. Jesus has overcome the world. All right? Amen. Thank you guys so much for, for having me this morning. It really is an honor to be here. If you'd like to learn more about the Montana Family Foundation, if you'd like to get involved in the culture war, um, if you feel God tugging on your heart this morning, uh, Find me. I live here in Helena. I'm easy to find. Talk with Tom. He has my information. Um, uh, I'm easy to find. You can get a hold of me. I, I'd love to train up warriors for Christ and, and help with that. Um, I'd also, you know, uh, Pastor Paul has talked the past couple messages. You know, if, if anyone has an interest in the law, in going to law school, um, you know, Many are called to, to be missionaries, to be pastors, but believe it or not, you can actually be called to be a lawyer. <laughs> you can stumble into that like I have. And if, if you feel God tugging on your heart that, you know, maybe, maybe I should go be a lawyer. I'm really good at arguing. Um, <laughs> come and argue with me um, and come talk to me. Um, so can I pray for you? Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the opportunity to, to serve you this morning and to speak with this amazing church and these amazing people, Lord. I pray that you bless them, bless this church, bless these people, and help us to be bold. Help us to speak with conviction and with love and to proclaim your gospel message, no matter the consequences, no matter the threats, no matter what's happening around us in this culture war, that we would be warriors for you. And Lord, you, you give us purpose. We have many different talents. Lord, if there's anyone in this room that is interested in being involved in this culture war in whatever capacity, Lord, I, please give them courage. Encourage them to join the ranks. We love you, God. We thank you so much for this amazing church body and this amazing opportunity to work to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Guys, give him another hand clap. Praise the Lord. He already said it. He's on the forefront. He's on the cutting edge. But we need more people that are called to be constitutional attorneys in our state and in our nation. Amen. And so Derek will be here. If you have any question for him, just come up and ask him. I mean, he's here for a, a few minutes to just talk to you guys about what's going on. And we just need to get more involved. Amen. And I remember it's been about eight years ago, but we were at a Thursday night prayer meeting service. And uh, literally, we were just praying. And I began to just sense that the hand of God was on Donna Elford and a governmental mantle was being placed on her, and she's the one, Derek. She'll come in here, and she'll go, you guys, we need to be there on Monday morning at 8 o'clock, and we need to, and I mean, she, you know, and I go, Donna, you remind me at 6.30 a.m., and so I come running up there, you know, to be involved in something, but we need more and more to be involved, amen? We don't live in a country that says you can't be involved. We live in a country that says we the people, amen? It's the consent of we the people. And so stand with me all over this place. Give somebody a hug. Give somebody a handshake. And God bless you guys. And just come up and talk to Derek at the end of the service. Ask him questions. Amen. He's here for you guys. God bless you. Thank you again for coming today. Bless you guys.